Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wilford coming to you from Quito, Ecuador. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson launched a tour of conservative Latin American governments on Thursday. His first stop was in Mexico, where he met with President Enrique Peña Nieto. His next stop is in Argentina to meet with President Mauricio Macri. He then goes on to Peru and Colombia. Tillerson's visit to Argentina is significant because it comes at a time when President Macri is trying to push through sweeping neoliberal reforms in Argentina against strong opposition from unions and social movements. Also, Tillerson is trying to rally support for U.S. efforts to isolate the government of President Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. Joining me from Buenos Aires to analyze Tillerson's visit and to the current situation in Argentina is Professor Attilio Boron. Atilio is professor of political science and sociology at the University of Buenos Aires, and he's written extensively on Latin American politics and social movements. Thanks for joining us today, Atilio. Hello, thank you very much for your invitation. So let's start with the current situation in Argentina. Earlier this week, President Macri had back to back, uh, sorry, had to backtrack on his uh, labor and pension reforms due to the massive resistance from unions and social movements. So first, what were these reforms about? And second, what does this backtracking mean? Uh, does it mean that the reforms are defeated? Well, uh, Macri is, uh, didn't expect such a very strong opposition to the pension reform. Uh, he thought that the pension reform would pass very easily in the parliament, in the Congress, but there were two huge demonstrations on Thursday, uh, December the 14th, on Monday, December 18, in which hundreds of thousands of people were demonstrating against the reform. And that uh, brought about a very, very strong confrontation with the police, uh, which uh, exerted an incredible brutality in the repression of the, um, of the, manif of the demonstration, uh, never seen since the times of the military dictatorship. Okay, and as a result of that, what happened was that in the Congress there was the uh, approval of the law by a small margin, but uh, the problem is that the implementation of the reform is in question because uh, hundreds of organizations representing the people, uh, the, the retired people, the, the old people, are uh, suing the government because what they see as a major infringement of their rights. And there is a constitutional prescription in Argentina that once you are granted a right, the right cannot be taken away by any government. So there is what they call a progressive uh, built-in mechanism in the constitution. So if, if you are granted the right to, to be a retired person at 65, then no government can say that from now on, you can retire only when you are 70, because this would be an encroachment of rights who were granted by the Constitution. So, to sum up, even though uh, the law was approved, there is a lot of question regarding the application of the law, the implementation of the law in the, in the, in the months to come. The other story is the labor reform, uh, which is, uh, um, was withdrew from the agenda of the Congress that President Macri wanted in the extraordinary period of session of the Congress, that means in January and February, uh, to discuss the law. But the Peronist uh, group in the, in the Senate, which is very, very important yet, not only Kirchnerism, but also the non-Kirchnerist Peronistas, agreed that the law cannot be discussed yet that it is necessary a new round of consultation with labor unions and civil society. So we are in a sort of stalemate uh, as for now. Well, what other neoliberal economic measures has Macri managed to push through so far? Um, I understand that many, uh, that hundreds of thousands have been laid off in the past year. Um, and what has been the reaction to these reforms uh, that have happened so far? And uh, what has been their effect on Argentine society? Well, you know, uh, the project, uh, the uh, project that uh, the uh, Macri government has is clearly inspired in the more reactionary versions of the uh, American politics. I mean, for instance, Ronald Reagan 
and now Donald Trump, and in the case of the Europeans, in Margaret Thatcher. There is a very systematic attack on the labor leaders and the labor unions. Uh, the idea is that to go toward a system of complete labor flexibility, a precarization of labor, but this is a country in which the degree of organization of the working classes and the laborers is very, very strong. It's the highest in Latin America. So even though there is a, a serious suspicion that many of the big uh, labor unions are directed and are, uh, are led by corrupt uh, uh, leaders, still they have the possibility to make very strong statements and also carry out political actions to defend the basic income of the, um, their affiliates. So uh, Macri is stumbling against, against this role, but uh, he is determined. We are uh, in face of a government which is determined to go in front of any obstacle in order to promote uh, the neoliberal agenda. And this neoliberal agenda means a very drastic reduction of the fiscal deficit, which is quite high in Argentina. Or historically, it's not a question of the last years or something which can be attributed to Cristina. It's, it's, it's a chronic problem, like the other chronic problem in Argentina is inflation. And when you combine both of them, then there is a, a, a lot of unrest in the people, especially the salaried workers, those who have a fixed income, and the, the senior citizens who also have a fixed income as a pension, uh, because what the government is trying to do is to reduce inflation, reducing the fiscal expenditures. But the problem is that most of the fiscal expenditures are devoted to the attention uh, or the providing of social benefits, which cannot be cut without provoking a very strong reaction of the people who are affected by those. So we are in a very, very delicate moment. The government has uh, fallen in a massive indebtedness, foreign indebtedness, uh, um, uh, with the help of American friends. We are providing a lot of money, but not in productive investment, but taking advantage of the financial speculation. You know, in Argentina, it is really uh, a sort of uh, paradise for uh, any big investor, because here you can bring dollars. You buy dollar, which is quite cheap in Argentina, and then you move the, from dollar to pesos, and you uh, put your pesos in a special form of safe deposit, OK? Uh, 30 days, 60, 90 days, in, and the, the effective rate of interest are staggering. You are talking about rate of interest in the, in the vicinity, in, in real terms, of 10, 12 percent in dollars. So there is a lot of money coming, but very, very little of that money is directed toward productive investment, creation of jobs, which we are not created under, under Macri, or uh, the uh, fight against poverty, which uh, has remained stable and even with a small tendency to become more and more important. If um, the reforms are affecting large segments of the population negatively, why is it that in uh, last October, uh, Macri's party won a significant uh, uh, segment of the vote, I believe it was 41% of the vote, which is more than any other party, uh, including that of former President uh, Christina Kirchner. W what explains his relative success at the polls last at the last election? Well, uh, the, what, what Macri got in, in this last uh, congressional election, which is the first after, after he took over office, is basically the same percentage which was uh, obtained by Alfonsín and Néstor Kirchner. So uh, the propaganda, the regime is very, very prone to make uh, propaganda as a special field of public policy in Argentina. You know, they say that there was a fantastic uh, performance. When you look in comparative perspective, both Alfonsín and uh, Kirchner obtained in the first parliamentary congressional election after they took over the presidency, they got more votes and more uh, proportion of votes. Not much more, 
and more. But what can explain this anyway? It was an important success. Well, the important success is because the opposition so far is completely divided. Peronism is in disarray. Kirchnerism is also in part in disarray, not completely, but is in disarray. And because there was a very bad choice by Cristina, which decided not go uh, in, in the ticket with somebody which may emerge from what we call a PASO, which means internal elections within a political force. Uh, she decided not to admit any competition uh, with Mr. Randazzo, Florencio Randazzo, who was his minister. And therefore, Cristina, without Randazzo, was not able to match the force of the official formula, which were really uh, headed by two people without any political gravitation. Uh, neither Bullrich nor uh, Mrs. Gonzalez were people known in the province of Buenos Aires, uh, but they were, Cristina was competing against the Cambiemos brand, okay? Cambiemos have become a political brand. Uh, it's something that you put in the, in the air and people know what, they, uh, what, what that means. And no, no matter who are the candidates, the candidates that the sent to the province of Buenos Aires were two completely unknown candidates. However, they were able to defeat Cristina by three percentage points. But that was a, a, a mistake error in the campaign, a mistake in the campaign. Otherwise, Cristina may have been the winner in the province of Buenos Aires. So that created a, a momentum, very, very important. But in December, on the basis of that, momentum in last October, the government saw that the people would be quiet, no more demonstration, no more picket, no, 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 no more picketing, no more nothing. And they made a, a fatal mistake. They thought that they had already get hold completely of the situation, but they underestimate the importance of the reaction which will take place in Argentina when you start to introduce this kind of policies. This country is very different from others in Latin America. Take the case of Brazil, in which you have a much more acquiescent or passive uh, laboring classes. In Argentina, uh, it's quite on the contrary. And so the government saw that the electoral outcome was enough for them to go ahead in the program, and they didn't think that the reaction would come out, and the reaction came and was very, very strong. So now we are in a sort of limbo. And eh? we're in a sort of limbo. And the game will start uh, in full force in March, uh, this March. Let's turn to uh, U.S. Secretary of State Tillerson's visit to Argentina. Here's a clip of what Tillerson had to say about Venezuela just before he left, to the, uh, left the U.S. for Latin America. The corrupt and hostile regime of Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela clings to a false dream and antiquated vision for the region that has already failed its citizens. It does not represent the vision of millions of Venezuelans or in any way comport with the norms of our Latin American, Canadian, or Caribbean partners. Our position has not changed. We urge Venezuela to return to its constitution, to return to free, open, and democratic elections, and to allow the people of Venezuela a voice in their government. So that was Rex Tillerson. I should add that Tillerson also said, in reference to uh, deposing the elected president of Venezuela, he said, quote, in, in the history of Venezuela, and in fact, the history of Latin American and South American countries, often at times, it is the military that handles that, that is, handles a transition um, uh, to get rid of a president. Uh, so uh, just, Atilio, how is uh, the Trump administration, given what, uh, uh, what uh, the position that uh, Trump is taking and Tillerson is taking, how is the Trump administration being perceived by Argentine government and uh, how likely it is, that, is it that they would support uh, sanctions or other kinds of isolation uh, against uh, Venezuela? Well, you know, the, the Macri government uh, is very anxious to serve as a sort of proxy of the U.S. government. Uh, nothing would be more um, uh, easy or more, more pleasant for Mr. Macri to be designated as the official representative of the United States in Latin America in order to lead the crusade against the Venezuelan government. Uh, 
this is uh, he made the issue of Venezuela one of the issues in his political campaign in the presidency and ever since he took over the presidency in Argentina the Venezuela the attack on Venezuela was a constant I would say was the only main direction of the foreign policy of Argentina Argentina is strongly the Argentine government is strongly concerned with Venezuela, but they don't give a damn for what is going on, for instance, in countries like Colombia, in which uh, popular leaders, uh, social leaders are killed by the hundreds every month, according to official statistics, uh, which uh, are very well known, or uh, the, this government is not concerned about the killing of journalists in Mexico. Uh, nine uh, journalists were killed last year, in Mexico, this is not a problem of freedom of the press or freedom of speech. Not is a problem for Mr. Luis Almagro in OEA. So Macri is part of all this general strategy of the US. It's a, an important piece. It's important because it's a government that when you compare, for instance, with the government of Mexico, which has an awful uh, image as a very, very corrupt government, or with the government of Colombia, which is the other one, in which there is also many people thinking that either Mexico and Colombia are narco states, that mean states which have been absolutely penetrated by the narcos. The role of um, Macri is uh, strongly enhanced for the Trump administration, because it's the only government which they, they, they can say is a government which came to power through uh, honest elections. This is not the case in the case in Mexico, and there are many doubts in, in Colombia. Brazil cannot make of, uh, uh, can do, cannot uh, see of uh, any help because uh, the Mr. Temer is um, a government which came after a sort of uh, the soft uh, coup d'état, eh? golpe blando, as they say. So the only one which has some degree of gravitation in the region is Macri. This is why Tillerson is coming here. Uh, this is not because uh, the Argentine is very important in economic or political terms in the long uh, term uh, for the United States, but it's a very important ally in this offensive against Maduro and against Venezuela. And this is why Tillerson is coming here and the other presidents of the region will meet here in Buenos Aires or in Bariloche with Tillerson. Still, we don't know exactly where the meeting will take place. But of course, this obsession with Venezuela and these um, attacks on Venezuela as a country in which the people cannot express is ridiculous because, you know, Venezuela is a country which has had more than 20 elections in the last uh, 19 years, and uh, uh, most of the elections uh, were elections in which there was no one saying that it was a corrupt uh, election or there were fraud, like, for instance, the, the horrendous fraud uh, which was perpetrated in Honduras, which, however, uh, did not bother the, the Trump administration. So we know very well these policies of the US in Latin America. And there is also something which is the historical record. The U.S. has failed everywhere in Latin America to create a single democratic government. The, the contribution of the American foreign policy in Latin America was essentially to uh, dismantle democratic governments and not create new democratic governments. Okay, so we are not expecting nothing very different from Tillerson visit now this day. And my concern is the sufferings of the Venezuelan people because, as Tillerson has said, uh, this, the proof of the success of our policies is that now the Venezuelan economy has collapsed. So all this story that uh, the Bolivarian government was saying about the guerra economica, the economic warfare, well, it was true because it was the, 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 the government of the U.S. who has said very proudly, we succeeded because now the economy in Venezuela is in shambles. And this is really uh, quite immoral. And I am not sure that the people in Venezuela will be very, very happy uh, with this sort of statement by Tillerson, which in general also was repeated by uh, the chief of the, the of the CIA and also by Ambassador uh, Lilian Azalde in the Southern Command.
In the little time that we have remaining, I just want to address one more issue. Last year, when we interviewed yeah. you, you said that the presidential election in Ecuador was the Latin American left's Stalingrad. Now that the election was won by the center left in Ecuador um, at the time, uh, but it was now since then, uh, the government or the, the movement that is, has been split between a Correa faction and a Moreno faction. And now, how do you see the situation that is in Latin America as a whole now? Did the Latin American left lose this battle of Stalingrad after all? Well, I am not sure that the, the, the battle has stopped or has finished. Uh, there, is, uh, there are two or three very important small battles to be played, not a small, uh, but I mean, are part of the general battle, which is the Mexican battle in which Andrés Manuel López Obrador is clearly the front runner. But you know, in Mexico, you can win the election, but then all the political tricks uh, may uh, uh, produce a, a completely different result. Uh, in in uh, Brazil, uh, Bra uh, Lula is clearly the front runner with 51% of voting intention against 15% of Mr. Jair Bolsonaro, which is the second one in the show. Uh, we should wait what happened this year in order to pass a definite verdict about this Stalingrad battle. Uh, I think that still there are a few combats which are very important in Mexico, uh, in Brazil, of course. Can you imagine if Lula wins in Brazil and he's not prohibited to participate in election, that would be a major, in ha have a major impact over all the region in Latin America. The same if they can stop Andrés Manuel López Obrador. And even in Colombia, there is a very close race in this moment eh, eh, in, in which Gustavo Petro, representing the center-left coalition, is uh, practically um, uh, he, 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 as a second in, in the race, but very, very close to the, the, the front runner. And uh, there will be a uh, a uh, second round and in the elections in Colombia. That may imply that the Petro could uh, eventually become uh, president in, in Colombia. So I would say that it is a little bit earlier to start to uh, pray to the, the, the funeral uh, or, uh, yeah, prayers uh, for the left in Latin America. We have to wait. Okay. This year is absolutely crucial. Okay, we're, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there, but we hope to have you back on again. I was speaking to Professor Atilio Boron of, of the University of Buenos Aires. Thanks again, Atilio, for having joined us today. No, it was a great pleasure to be in this conversation. Bye-bye now. Bye. And I'm Greg Wilpert for The Real News Network.